let's get started in. Uh, so this week's speaker, this week's speaker is Fridolin Weber, or as he's known on these shores as uh, Fridolin Weber. Um, so he uh, comes to us from Bavaria. He received his PhD from Ludwig Maximilians University, which actually is named after two people, not one person with a hyphenated name. Um, and uh, uh, then uh, came to the U.S. as a postdoc originally at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory on the hill above the University of California, and then did another postdoc at the University of Notre Dame before coming here. In the internet was a little unclear on whether you arrived in 2002 or 2003, but okay. Um, and so he's uh, he's been here. He's he's ascended the ranks here and is now a distinguished professor and uh, he's associate chair of the physics department. Uh, he's through the whole time uh, maintained a, an NSF funded research program in dense matter, particularly dense matter in neutron, in neutron stars and uh, possible, possibly uh, deconfining fourth phases of dense matter um, involving lots of students. And I think at this point, if I say any more, I will start giving his talk for him. And so he's going to tell us about, uh, <laughs> going to tell us about uh, uh, early stages of neutron stars becoming neutron stars. I hope. Thanks so much for the introduction. Uh, so. So this will be a talk on, on dense matter and exotic stuff. So if you like it exotic, then this is the right place to be. Uh, and so what I want to do is just give you an idea. I mean, first of all, what neutron stars are, what proton neutron stars are, why they are important. A bit of a history. And uh, I prom I mean, promise that in my in the abstract it says it's a pedagogical talk. So I may stick to this most of the time. There are a couple, couple of slides which are mathematical, but I promise you. You know, there's no need to understand any of this. Also, I'm giving some bit of a history, historical background so that you understand the bigger picture of why this has become important, where it's comes to what, and what the challenges are. Okay, so let's get going here. And so here's a big uh, bit of an outline. What I want to do is, first of all, I will talk a bit about uh, the universe at large, basically tell you what the universe, what the ingredient, I mean, the inventory is, what kind of, you know, how many objects are there. And then a topic, you know, a typical galaxy like ours, there are about, I mean, <clears throat> hundreds of, or millions of, of compact objects. They are called compact objects, uh, which are white dwarfs, neutron stars, and low mass black hole. Uh, low mass black holes, so they are similar properties, I mean, radial properties. Uh, and then to understand these properties, these objects, one has to understand some what goes on at super high density. So neutron stars, when they are formed, they have tremendously high temperatures, up to 10 to the 12 Kelvin. Uh, for those of us in, you know about nuclear physics. If you have a nucleus, if you heat it up even to 10 to the 10 Kelvin, which is of course very hot <laughs> on a terrestrial scale, and the atomic nucleus doesn't care, it's still cold for an atomic nucleus. But if you keep heating up and up from 10 to the 10 to 10 to the 12 Kelvin, about 100 MeV on an energy scale, then uh, neutrons and protons begin to sweat, uh, and uh, you <coughs> create lots of interesting new physics, new particles, and this may happen in, uh, in a neutron. So this will be the topic here, and there's a bit about field theory and some quantum physics, but again, it's, I'm going to keep it basic. I just want to give you an idea of what, what needs to be done, what kind of equations need to be solved. To do this uh, kind of research, uh, and there will be some results along the way. Uh, I'm not sure we'll have time to talk about pairing gaps and uh, thermal properties, uh, which I just done recently. I always have a hard time to, to skip work matter because this is one of my favorite topics. Uh, so. And then there, are, of course, there will be a list of, I mean, there will be quite a few topics which I'm not able to cover. Uh, they will be summarized at the end. So this is a few uh, out by the Hubble Space, I mean, a couple of views, actually, two pictures taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. And what you see here is just 124 uh, millions, I think, of the entire sky. So it's like taking a, a tennis ball at a distance of about 100 meters. It covers a tiny amount of of space, I mean, of area. And what you see is actually here about, I mean, 3,000 galaxies. All these dots uh, were extended objects here. They are galaxies, so don't start to count. It's about 3,000. And again, it's just 124 millions of the entire sky. Okay? So if you look at basically the content of what's in, in one galaxy, so we have about 100 billion galaxies. In fact, maybe the number goes up with the, the recent telescope, the James Webb. Uh, but there are about 100 billion galaxies in our in our universe, uh, and uh, in each of these galaxies, we have about 100 billion stars, like in our Milky Way. Uh, and there are quite a few, I mean, billions of these objects actually are, are collapsed. They are not stars, they don't shine. I mean, they shine, not shine in the visible regime, but they shine in X-rays. 
soft X-rays are, uh, and uh, there are you know, compact objects. These are white. There are three types of compact objects: are white dwarfs, neutron stars, and, and low mass black holes. I'm not talking about just gigantic, massive black holes, which are believed to be in pretty much every galaxy, uh, like in our galaxy also. But this is not uh, just uh, the, the topic of this talk. Okay, so these are white dwarfs, neutron stars, and pulsars. And just to give you an idea of what, uh, how big they are, what goes on, what the physics, what kind of physics we expect here, let's begin with the Earth. This is a white dwarf. The Earth, white dwarfs have about the same radius as the, the Earth. We figure they can be up to six, seven, eight, ten thousand kilometers in radius. They are uh, made up of atomic nuclei, sort of arranged in a lattice. It will not be perfect, as perfect as shown here, but the atomic nuclei are arranged in a lattice, and there's electron gas in between. And electrons are relativistic, they provide all the pressure. Gravity flows inward, the electron pressures outward, it's a stellar configuration at equilibrium, which is called a white dwarf. All the mass is sitting in atomic nuclei. Electrons are basically massless, but the electrons are very important because they provide the pressure. If you would take the electron pressure away, really, white dwarf, white dwarfs will collapse. One <clears throat> prominent white dwarf is Sirius B. I think it's about 100 or 200,000 light years away. Uh, this is the series A, series B is about this white dwarf, this tiny dot here. Uh, it just basically a white dwarf in our neighborhood. Uh, and uh, you know, white dwarfs, for many years people thought white dwarfs, the physics is pretty much explored, but that's actually by no means the case. Uh, just recently there was a, a paper that we published, this was in 2021. Uh, and uh, so researchers really at the uh, Sviki uh, TF timing, whatever it's called, facility, at Mount Palomar, they found this white dwarf. It's, uh, it's the telephone number, kind of complicated, but it's the most massive, uh, most likely most massive white dwarf that has been found so far. The mass is 1.25. If you make them, what might make this white dwarf even a bit more massive? Gravity gets stronger and stronger and collapses the whole thing. If you're Newton stars, so you can <coughs> start out of equilibrium. And the radius is about 2,000, more than 2,000 kilometers. So this is slightly larger than the moon. So we have this very unusually. Massive white dwarf, but it's just unusually small. And so it has been a big challenge for theoreticians uh, to understand actually what kind of, I don't know, what's the composition, what kind of, you know, what makes a white dwarf so massive and so small. The rotation here is six point, I mean, almost seven minutes. So it takes seven minutes for the star to rotate, to uh, do one rotation, uh, which is also for a white dwarf because there is a big uh, 2,000 kilometers, is a very high rotation rate. So I'm not going to talk about white dwarfs. I did some work with my students and collaborators on white dwarfs magnetic fields, uh, and uh, also um, work physics with related to white dwarfs, but it's not the thing. So from white dwarfs, then the next more complex object that would be a neutron star. So they have about the mass uh, one, I mean, maybe up, up to about twice the mass of the sun. But see, their radius is just 10 to 15 kilometers. So you know it's. <clears throat> If you shot just have done too much matter on a white dwarf, gravity wins, uh, the white dwarf collapses and forms this just one stable compact uh, uh, object or left over that exists. And this is the, these are white dwarfs. I mean, these are neutron stars. So they have radiant they are really small, 10 to 15 kilometers. Uh, they are close to black holes. So if you take a black hole here, well, the mass is two solar masses. If you take a black hole with a two solar mass, and it's two solar masses. Uh, and in my own we use the units, the rotation cost is equal to one, speed of light is equal to one. So the mass of the sun becomes 1.5 kilometers. So if you do the mass, the radius of this black hole would be nine kilometers, which is just a little bit smaller than the radius of a neutron star. So if you have a neutron star in a binary, it doesn't matter on the neutron star. The neutron star shrinks, doesn't get big, it shrinks. And in fact, at some point, it may collapse and form a low mass star. Okay, so you have white dwarfs as stable configurations. Then you have neutron stars and low mass black holes. The fact that you have these objects that are so small, but have a, a huge mass, this means that the matter in their center is, is, is extremely compressed. So you, you talk about densities on the surface, you have hydrogen in helium, plasma, and then the fish you have an outer crust and inner crust, and then basically for me, it's green stuff, here's a red color uh, stuff. So this is all this called, what's called the core, where you have matter compressed to nuclear densities in higher, up to five or 10 times. Uh, the size of the density of the nucleus. So this is really tremendous. Uh, it's basically a gigantic atomic nucleus sitting out there and waiting to be explored. So also, if you have questions, please uh, don't hesitate to ask. Uh, 
can interrupt at any time. So this is a little bit of a slide that shows how neutron stars, proton neutron stars are formed. So it all begins with a core collapse, supernova, so an object that has in it a sun that burns hydrogen to helium, helium to carbon, carbon to oxygen, keeps going until you have iron uh, at the, the center. Iron is the most stable atomic nucleus, so you don't get any energy anymore if, if, you, if you keep fusing. So you have more and more iron that builds up in these uh, uh, things uh, that are burning. And once the iron core has grown to a size of about 1.4, solar masses, uh, then the thing just collapses. You have a supernova, uh, and uh, the most of the mass is being expelled into space. For example, the crab nebula is over, uh, left over of a supernova. And what remains is a tiny object, uh, a Newton star, just 10, 12, 10, 12, 15 kilometers in radius. Uh, that emits tremendous amounts of radiation. Initially, these stars are very hot, so they emit I mean, photons, even if they're cold or cold on the scale. Uh, they emit neutrinos. This depends on just where they are in the uh, evolution, uh, time evolution. So initially, they, these proton neutron stars, so you may call these very young neutron stars, they're very hot. The temperature is up to 10, 12 Kelvin, like under 100 MeV. And so even on a nuclear scale, this is very hot. And so neutrons proton feel the temperature, the heat, and they change the properties. And also because the temperature is so high, you have many degrees of freedom not just neutrons and protons as an atomic nucleus, but if you squeeze atomic nucleus together, you know, you produce this you, you extra mass energy, you produce new particles. Uh, there's more on this a little bit later. So this here we talk about proton neutron stars, the lifetime is just, I mean, at the, we talk about a second or so, even below that. And then the star, you know, cools down quickly because it emits radiation, thermal radiation. And so what happens also is that the main field has neutrinos, so neutrinos bounce around in these stars. They were already phased, but when the star cools down, then the mean free path of neutrinos gets longer and longer. At some point, it gets more, it's, it's longer, it's greater than 10, 10 kilometers. So the neutrinos escape, and this speeds up here the evolution to from a proton to a neutron star. So neutron stars are used here <laughs> blue for blue, I guess, means color. I mean, means, means cold. <laughs> so you have, go from 10 to 12 to 10 to 10 Kelvin. Those are days, uh, but the difference is the temperature. And, uh, and then these stars, they live for millions, millions, of, tens of millions of years, and uh, they settle down in, if you want, in different colors that are flavor states. Flavor states. So one would be they up of this, end up with neutron stars, sit there, uh, emit radiation, mostly, I mean, photons, not so much neutrinos for the first, I mean, uh, a few, I mean, up to five, six hundred, maybe a thousand years. A neutrino emission cools down these stars, and then after about a thousand years, photon emission from the surface takes over, it's more dominant. But anyway, they take away energy, the star cools down, becomes colder and colder. They can be seen in X-ray telescopes, not on the Earth, because X-rays not hit the surface of the Earth, but you see those in radio telescopes, they have more than a second. So if the stars are rotating, this is shown here, so this like, tiny little dot here, this is just a neutron star, it has a tremendous magnetic field, and uh, I can see that the star rotates. You may remember this from the EM. Uh, you have a magnetically charged sphere, and so the rotation axis is crystallized. I mean, magnetic gap is crystallized with respect to the rotation axis. But in half, this is a rotating sphere like that, and these very strong electric fields are being induced on the surface. In this case, they are so strong that this electric field actually pull out particles from the surface of a neutron star. And the electrons, the first to, uh, to go, are the electrons. So the electrons, the are being pulled out by strong fields, I mean, strong electric fields, and they move, they propagate along the magnetic field line, so it's got motion, acceleration, so they accelerate the charge, and the air radiation. So, <clears throat> light cones along the magnetic field now, north and south pole, and for each time when light cones reach past an observer, I mean, telescope on the Earth, or radio telescopes, then radio astronomers see a flash and <clears throat> blimp, uh, and so they can count, determine how quickly, how quickly, how quickly these stars rotate. In fact, the record holder, the most rapidly spinning neutron star at this point, spins at 720 rotations per second. So, you know, 10, 12 kilometers. And if you, if you would sit on the surface of this object, of course, it would be squeezed to nothing. But then if you would sit there, the speed would be basically 50, 60, 70% speed of light. So they have a tremendously a powerhouse, which in many cases actually powers in an, an entire leftover nebula. I mean, uh, we are like the crap. So this would be isolated neutron stars. Uh, radio pulsars, you can also have neutron stars in binaries. It happens that in some cases, for significant global clusters, a neutron star 
Turbocast is a kind of dirt environment, so you have lots of low mass, I mean, white dwarfs, and it happens that a, white, I mean, a neutral side of white dwarf, they come too close to each other, and they, they find a, a, a porn form of binary. And then the neutral star, because you know, so it's the minimum amount of gravity, the star begins to start manifolding the white dwarf, and then that starts <coughs> the whole system to move around the center of mass, which is close to the neutral star, but not quite at the neutral star. So the mass is being uh, pulled away from the white right dwarf, creates the height of the neutral star from the accretion disk and from the accretion disk ladder to jump onto the star at a pretty efficient rate of like, you know, uh, I'm not sure how many of them. Yeah. A, 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 a nuclear bombs, hydrogen bombs at the same time go on. The matter is basically has hits the surface of the neutral side. It's fifty percent the speed of light. So you have thermonuclear reactions, uh, and hot spots, and uh, little objects are also being explored of in great detail. Can be observed. There's one neutral star. This thing is really amazing. So this neutral star is this uh, uh, picture is taken at uh, you know, three years difference. This is 1999, 1999, 1999, 1996, 1999. The neutral star is moving along here with this uh, yellow blob. And uh, so the neutral star was formed in a supernova, this is the supernova explosion. But then it got a kick, a uh, wave was burst. It moves at about 100 or something, 150 kilometers per second away from its birthplace. Uh, and it, uh, it shines in X rays, so this is taken. Uh, by an astronomer at the Stony Brook, uh, and it's an isolated neutral star that shines an X-ray, soft X-ray, the temperature is typically 10 to 6 Kelvin, uh, and you can actually see this object with a proper instrument uh, and see moving through space. Then there are a few more candidates uh, that I want to mention. These are soft gamma repeaters, and it's called an almost X-ray pulsar. These are objects that uh, they have very super, super strong mag uh, magnetic fields, a canonical neutral star like. Uh, it is on the order of 10 to 12 Gauss, 10 to 13 is the top star over the course of time to one up to eight. These magnetars that have magnetic fields on a surface which are up to 10 to 17, maybe 10 to the 18 Gauss. So this is a tremendous amount of magnetic field and strength, and there's so much energy action in the magnetic field that some point it could, it could, it could even destroy the star despite, despite the super strong gravity. So this is a new class of, of neutral stars, and then there's this compact, uh, central compact object which are a bit un unusual. I'm not sure if people really agree what this is. They are, seem to be very small, small radii, less than 10 kilometers, but this could be a measurement issue. So five, six kilometers, and it would be really small, and you cannot make a neutral star that small. That's impossible. Gravity cannot do that. But there are ideas about exotic phases of matter, which can, <laughs> can do the trick. But that's basically you know, also a very interesting area of research. So if you take a neutral star, this is to the, the Crab Nebula, uh, uh, the light of the, the nebula has uh, the mixture of like say, uh, 10 by 15 light years for this entire thing. And it's powered by the, a neutral star that sits right at the center here, but you know, 10 kilometers it spins. The thing rotates at uh, 33 hertz, so 33 times per second. It's kind of slow, but it's quite fast. So in the, in, in the uh, radiation that's being emitted by the neutral star makes the entire nebula shine. That's quite amazing. Really a power uh, and uh, you know the instruments that astronomers use is there's one. This is not a complete list. Uh, there's parks in Nigeria and a very large array in New Mexico. This is the new dish in China. It's still called FAST, the 500 meter arbitrary uh, disk. So it's a, it's a natural basin, 500 meter across, and then it gets there radio uh, emission coming from the <laughs> from the neutral star. And this is one instrument. It's called NICE. The neutral star interior composition explorer, which is specifically designed actually to take data and explore what kind of what we, what can be learned about from uh, mass and radius determination uh, and radiation about the interior composition. So specifically uh, aimed at neutral stars. There's also, of course, uh, I have to mention that uh, other computational wave detectors at this point. And, um, now there are more, but uh, initially there was LIGO. Uh, LIGO um, in Hanford, in Livingston, Louisiana, this is Washington State, and uh, this is Virgo, uh, after the constellation Virgo in Italy. And so what these instruments do is they observe radiation that's produced, gravitational radiation produced by emerging neutron stars, it can also be a neutron star black hole, can be black hole, black hole. So anything that's compact, the more compact, the better, because then it really just creates uh, ripples on the 
fabric of space time that propagate along uh, move through the Earth, and when it happens, then the Earth wobbles, but of course, not really wobbles. But the, the, the change is uh, in, in this is caused by, uh, by a gravitation wave that passes through the Earth that is about a 10,000, that this is about a proton. And, but it, it, it can be measured, so it's absolutely amazing. This is what these machines do, and they provide information from the ring down about, uh, well, about masses. Uh, about the deformation of how mass of which extended so it can be deformed. I mean, they are hard to deform because they are um, gravity binds them together, makes them really super dense, like a rigid body sphere, but they can be deformed. And this depends also what's kind of in, what's inside these neutrons. So uh, I put together here a list of uh, issues of, first of all, remarkable properties and also. Uh, connection to physics, so what areas of physics need to be involved to study neutral stars, proton neutral stars, and to work on relativistic astrophysics. And one is, you know, we talk, we know that neutral stars are super dense, they, but at the core they have well, are five, ten times as dense as atomic nucleus. So you have to use, of course, advanced nuclear physics, particle physics, and uh, these systems, since they are too dense, particles at some point to become relativistic, relativistic effects become important. You also have to calculate medium effects of particles. You know, when they plow through a dense medium, there are medium effects which modify the mass of a particle, of quantum mechanical particle, momentum. Uh, and so this can be done to some extent using the Schrödinger equation, which is very hard, but you can also, when at some point, you should use a quantum relativistic quantum field theory. So QFTs, quantum field theories, can be effective and you can use those at different levels of, proxy, of approximation. Uh, and since the system is extremely relativistic, so quantum electrodynamics uh, it has, takes over, so ordinary cool, cool EM uh, is no longer doing the job because you have quantum mechanical effects. Uh, you have to basically look at photon. I mean, electric charges, they interact with the exchange of photons. And so you have to take this, this new picture into account. So classical physics just breaks down all over the place, such as quantum electrodynamics. And QCD is quantum chromodynamics, which describes the physics with the mathematical description of quarks and gluons. And uh, uh, more on this a bit later. So, this system is so dense. If you take a typical mass of a neutron star, take a calculate two MOR, two MOR. This is like a very important number because if, 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 as long as this number of an object is small compared to one, you can do Newtonian physics. Classic physics is fine. But if this is on the order, you know, for a neutron star, it's 0.6. So it is a lot of uh, small compared to one. So it, this means this is just an indication that you must use Einstein theory, which is of course a drawback because that's not an easy topic. But uh, uh, when you model these, when you mo model the want to model these stars properly, then you have to go abandoning the twin physics and this relativity. So awesome one is a little bit later. Uh, thermodynamics is the temperature so high that relativistic quantum gases. So what you have to do is is basically look at you use a many body theory that is uh, not at zero temperature, which is pretty bad enough, but you have to go to finite temperature. Come up with a formalism, which is known, has people have worked on that for years. But you have to basically work with a finite temperature field theory, or the thermodynamics, put all this consistency together. And uh, I don't do transport theory, but it's pretty really bad if you on equilibrium say, uh, to 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 study neutron stars. One also, what I should mention is here, that uh, neutron stars, is, these two people, Horowitz and Cardell, uh, pointed out if they, if they take the crust of a neutron star, the outer parts, then they are a billion times stronger than steel. Uh, you know, it really pushes physics to the extreme. Uh, neutron stars can also have mountains, so that most of them, they're likely most perfectly spherical. So if you look at delta R change in delta R over R, this is 10 to the minus eight. And it's basically harder, the experts were telling me that this would be almost impossible to use on or achieve for a sphere, for a perfectly poised sphere on the, on the Earth in a lab. But uh, Newton started to do that. But they can still have mountains, but the mountains would be just a couple of millimeters or centimeters because gravity is so strong. And anything that would tries to pull up, pile up, uh, it's just squeezed down. And uh, so we will have a good chance to have a perfect sphere. So, Let's talk about uh, this gentleman for a little bit. Uh, and again, I don't want to go into any details, but at least I want to show you what needs to be done to study neutron stars. And there are two major pillars. One is relativity, GR, because gravity in neutron physics is no longer applicable. And the second is that you have to use particle physics, Schrodinger-based theory, or something more. One of his theory to, to, to discuss the many 
work on the composition and uh, have a model for dense matter. At the end, what you want to solve Einstein's field equation is an equation of state, which you know from classical physics, it's a, uh, an ideal gas. It's a simple, simple case for an idea for an equation of state, but of course, they, here we have to, you're facing the same, same task, but you have to basically calculate or put together an equation of state for a quantum gas. Okay. So that's it. The theoretic setting is a little bit different. So uh, let's go back here to Einstein and let me just remind you what needs to be done. Uh, and so this is now, of course, Newton here. And from Newtonian physics, you know, there's a the gravitational potential called this U, or in this case, phi. And uh, you calculate, of course, one of the gravitation field. The source term here is the mass density uh, that you have inside a certain volume. And the mass density of the you know, gravitation potential you have this is the Earth, and this is the rotation potential for the Earth. So, this is what you have to solve. And so Einstein, of course, when he did uh, work on his theory of relativity, he, first of all, he did say, okay, now I want to have a theory. I mean, all the equations of physics that must be coherent. And what it means is basically that you have to write down one equation in one frame of reference. And if you do this in another frame of reference, then the speed at which frames of reference, as long as the speed is constant, the speed of the, should, the equation should not change. So, because if this were the case, this is special relativity. If this were the case, if you have one equation, one frame of reference in another form, uh, a slightly modified uh, the mathematical version of the equation in another frame, then you can take the difference in the in the equation, the mathematical form, to say something about your frame of reference. But that's not allowed. All frames of reference, initially this was special relativity, all frames of reference are identical. You can never tell. And so this, this goes back to Galilei, it's called the Galilei principle. Einstein applied this to four dimensional space time and developed special relativity, which takes this into account. But Einstein, he didn't stop at Galilei, he was much more radical. He said, uh, I want to have this principle of covariance or the invariance of equations of laws of physics uh, the, the, uh, for, for any frames of reference, no matter if the frames are in inertial frames, so move, uh, moving at the constant speed with each other, or, or even if the frames are accelerated. Uh, the mass and magnitude form of the equation must not change. So this is the principle of, of, of covariance. And you know, it took him a, a quite a, a number of years to figure all this out. So he looked for a counterpart to Newton's uh, law. And so you see there are two terms here, the first mass density, the rotation potential. So the sign that to make this the tensor equation, I shouldn't say that, I mean, shouldn't say that. We need tensor equations because tensor equations automatically they fulfill this condition. So if you have a ten, a lot of, if you write down the laws of physics as tensor equations in one frame of reference, if you transform this to another frame of reference, then the mathematical form is the same. So all the laws of physics should be in tensor equations, otherwise they would be frame dependent, and then you would have an issue. Remember, all frames of reference are identical. So we, what we need is is covariance, and covariance means we have to have write, write down the laws of physics. So you were looking for. A, a tensor which we can do the energy density, and this is in our language the energy momentum or energy stress tensor, which contains epsilon, but that's some extra terms. And so, in fact, to do this, to find this uh, counterpart is not so bad, this can be, be done pretty quickly. But the hard part was the, the gravitational potential to find a counterpart, a tensor version for the gravitational potential. So, initially, Einstein tried the Riemann tensor. The Riemann tensor basically describes curvature of, an, of a given object, a given geometry. But the Riemann tensor is something, you know, you have here these symbols, superscripts, mu and mu. They run from 0 to 3, 0 is time, 1 to 3 with the spatial coordinates, x, y, z, or r, z, and phi, depends on the kind of coordinate system you want to use. So you talk about a 4 times 4 or 16 objects here. Yeah? Uh, and, uh, well, going back to Riemann, so the Riemann tensor is a range 4, this is a range two superscripts, uh, the Riemann tensor is a very interesting four tensor. So we change do some mathematical tricks and do what's called contraction, sum over two indices, and then you can go from the Riemann tensor to uh, a very two tensor, like the Ricci tensor. Uh, and uh, this is actually what Einstein tried initially. So he had this, uh, the, 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 the Riemann tensor was called the Riemann tensor, calculated what's called the Ricci tensor, and then he said, okay, if this would be sort of my coordinate, coordinate question where you have, uh, Potential and our curvature is the Riemann tensor, and this would be equal to not four, but you have eight pi, the metric consistent, and then t mu nu. So, this was a, an equation he tried for a couple of years, but in fact, this equation didn't work because it violates energy momentum. I mean, uh, energy momentum. So, at the end, this was a long mathematical battle, this more history here. 
uh, how he found his field equation, basically lasted from 19, 1906, 1907 to 1915. So after 1915 was a very hectic year in, in, in November, I mean, in the fall of uh, 2015, Einstein published, I guess, four papers, one after another. Each one was a correction, the previous one, because he was panicking because he knew that also. Hilbert, uh, in the same year, was a, a great mathematician. He was working on the field equation. Einstein gave a couple of seminars over the summer in Göttingen in Germany. Uh, Hilbert invited him and he paid close attention. And he also tried to find a field equation of relativistic gravity. And uh, Hilbert began his began start from the equation principle. Uh, and in fact, he had a or correct tensor for this part over here. Uh, Einstein again, which is like this one because of this uh, energy, but then uh, in a year, uh, 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 couple of really uh, dense months and after, I mean, dense workers, so in the fall of 2015, he realized that he needs sex to here, minus one half, some geometry here to go through energy and length and conservation. Then, then he basically proposed this equation. Uh, this is called Einstein's field equation. So I didn't hesitate to show it here because the city is on, on TV. If you watch Einstein Genius or uh, GPBS, you see the Einstein's field equation over the time. So I thought I bought it off of it. Einstein's field equation. So this is the mystic gravity. This is what they have to solve to model compact objects. Uh, and uh, so this is Einstein's field equation. This is Einstein's conservation written down in that equation. But you know, this is the paper basically new. This is what we have to work with. Uh, I skipped the equations, so and just wanted to show you because this is really the, the implications that you that follow from the Einstein field equation are really radical. So Einstein space and time are, they are tied together to a four-dimensional system. This is point number one, and also space and time can be deformed. It's like a, a, a fluid or a, a dynamical system. You can you can squeeze it together, you can bend it, you can rotate it, deform it. So it's it's a dynamic concept, it's not just rigid uh, you know, frames of reference, one here, one there. That may be helpful to glass to do classical physics, but it's not a true physics. And so I wanted to show you a movie here that was done by, in fact, these are two merging yes, black holes uh, and uh, from the LIGO team at Caltech. And so what this movie shows is uh, merging black holes. And well, you should pay attention to not so much as black holes, but actually. The environment, I mean, what's around, because you see that in space and time, you know, is wobbling around, it shifts, it's, it's deformed, and so all of this comes out of Einstein's field equations. And uh, there's no doubt that Einstein's field equations, even on a strong limit up to you know neutron star densities, they are correct. There could still be options for something, you know, modifications, but that's uh, what it is. So if you, if you watch, see this neutron, I mean, two black holes or orbiting each other, at some point they're going to merge, emit the gravitation, the mid gravitation waves. But before I do that, you see all our space and time is just moved around and it's like a liquid, a fluid uh, in each location here, you know, you have different kinds of physics and, uh, you know, it's all driven by mass distributions. So mass distributions, they, they determine what happens in space time and even more, uh, modify space time. So that's a very different picture. So let's take a look at what you would get if you uh, do this for uh, neutral stars. I wanted to compare now, first of all, an object is would be an unrotating object, spheric symmetric. This model, this is actually are pretty easy to model. Kind of, uh, this is different here the linear rotating system, then the rotating system for our stars at the equator, they expand at the, at the pole, they flatten. And also, because of this, you know, you, uh, the entire uh, structure of this star is changing. So, to model this numerically, so I wanted to show you how it looks like in a mass. Uh, Central density diagram. So epsilon here is the density, the center of these objects. Uh, M is the mass, E is the mass of the center. So as you can hear, so this would be you know, the more mass concentration you have, the more mass it is. So the parameter is just the density at the center. Uh, so just to give you an idea here, the atomic nuclei would be sitting here. So all these stars are more than then atomic nuclei, such as numbers. So what are Atomic nucleus is corresponds to 140 uh, MeV per cubic meter, so uh, 2 by 5 times 10 to the 14 grams. So here we talk about up to 10 to 15 grams per cubic meter. It's more than a billion. So you see here, first of all, you see two lines. The first line is non-rotating, so all these are neutron stars. 
Can you have it? They are how much mass they have. They follow along this line, this, this blue uh, line here. There's a mass peak, this is this black dot here, and so it's beyond, so it's beyond the mass peak. Of course, I say it's the solution still, but you can show that these objects are unstable against the oscillations. So if you would produce these objects, then if you take a new to start, throw mad on, then you can start. The system becomes more massive, more dense, then they will all fall below by the curve. So basically, there's the curve ends here uh, at the side of the line. The same is true for a star that you take. All these stars here, they spin at the Kepler frequency, which is the highest possible frequency a star can take. I mean, it's not sure whether or not the Kepler limit, the Marshall limit, is, is reached in nature because there are instability modes that actually may limit uh, the neutral star rotation rate to lower values, maybe to 70, 80% of Kepler. Uh, but that's a different ballgame. So we, Important is that you can always assume, of course, this is a strict upper limit and rapid rotation. No object can spin more rapidly than the Kepler because then it would not break up into pieces. So it's interesting to look at the most case, most rapid. So what you see is rotation, first of all, increases the mass, but it's not that factor of a thousand or something. But you see the mass increase goes near for a this equation of two to something like 2.4. So it's doing a typically 20% mass increase, even if you have rotation at the Kepler. You don't double the masses. And also what you see is that the, the mass peak here moves to the left and it kind of probably shifted to the left because uh, then what you have is, you know, in, for, for non-rotating case, inside the stars, you have gravity, I mean, gravity inward and the nuclear force of so the equation of state pushing outward. So they, at each location, you have this balance of forces between, between the equation of state on the quantum gas outward and gravity. And if you have rotation in classical physics, you say I can have a centrifugal force to take a pressure. And so I need this pressure from the equation of state. And that pressure from the equation of state means that the energy just drops. And so that's the reason why these curves are shifted. Uh, the rotation could have shifted to the left. And also, what you see then, you can sort of compare, say, pick a model. I'm going to say one more time. So you can pick a model, then a neutral star, a pulsar, which is an isolated. Object that would be maybe maybe born a Pusillanus object that would be born over here. This has a quite a small three times nuclear density, and then you say that this object now spins down. It's got a creation, a wind of electric particle pairs, and what the stars do. So they spin down slow, very very slowly. Uh, it happens over very long time scales, but they slow down over the course of time. And this is happens when you see that the density drops. Going increases actually from 400 or three times to maybe something like four, 4.5 times nuclear saturation. So from here to here, before the star, I mean, the star is up at the another thing, so it's symmetrical. You are rotating at the Kepler along, along this path, the green lines, or you want to the red one or purple one, the density of this object is increasing. So, which means a star is a neutral star that spins down, or the neutral star down. Uh, increases its density, and this means the composition of this ob object inside or specifically in the core cannot remain the same. If you just take an atomic nucleus, squeeze it together, you produce no degrees of freedom. So, neutrons and protons are the most you know, on the inside atomic nuclei, but in this case, you may have produced new particles called hyperons or uh, baryons, uh, which are unstable in free space, but in, in a neutron star, it's poly blocking. So, you want, if you produce uh, these new particles, then they would be sitting there in, a, in, a, uh, in, in the core of a neutron star permanently. So this happens like along this path from high to from high frequencies to low frequencies because of a uh, tremendous increase in density. So I have a little movie here. I have to make this too dry. Uh, so I have about 40 minutes. Total is 250. It started at 3.30. Uh -huh. One hour. One hour is 50 minutes. One hour is 50. One hour is 50. That's good. So that's just what you wrote. So this is a, new, um, a model. I mean, um, yeah, a neutral star. It shows you, know, and it's actually based on a, like a full blown solution of an answer equation that shows you what happened when you have a neutral star spinning down. From high frequencies, this is the Kepler frequency. This is for this model, the star does more than 1,300 pages per second. So it's the breakup frequency, you know, in 
the pathway to this object spins down from high frequency stage to zero. So again, you know, you spin down, gravity gets smooth. So the full force is smooth. Weekends, gravity is the same, squeezes the floor together, so it will have something that's more and more spherical. And because of uh, the compression, you will produce new particles. And so there are quite a bunch of colors, so don't pay too much attention to all these colors. Just remember that each time when you see a new color, a new type of particle pops up, and then uh, the more the slower the spin rate, the more the system gets compressed and the more new particles. All can be calculated still consistently. There's a many body technique. So let's do that. So this is shown here. So now the star spins down basically to zero. And you see now, of course, if a circuit symmetric object, and you have all these extra colors, and each color corresponds to a new type of particle. Uh, bearing on the tip there, uh, it could be a boson condensate. Uh, so this is very interesting because during the spin down, data that you can observe from this object, and they may give us a hint of what actually happens inside this object. So compared to a, a collider experiment where you collide, for example, Brookhaven or CERN, when you collide, where you have your atomic nuclei. Ions uh, at higher, basically speed of light, and what you put, I mean, let's say Brookhaven energies, you put, the, what people do is they squeeze, I mean, produce a hot and dense matter, uh, hot and dense soup of, of baryons, all kinds of particles, but it's very short lived. It lives for something like 10 to the minus 22 seconds. So we have to look very quickly what happens. Here you have it basically forever. It's free. Ah, I just have to look at it by not <coughs> put together the proper instrument. Okay, so. Let's see. Uh, so the challenges that we wanted to, that we are facing to model these objects and figure out what happens. Uh, now, together here, a couple of issues that we need to be worried about. First of all, if you take a neutron star, our mass is less, radius is 10 kilometers, then the number of particles uh, which, uh, which a neutron star is made of could be the core, which basically where all the mass is. So if the other cut in the top, there's very little mass. But all the half uh, is. 99% of the mass of the neutron star comes from the core. And so uh, here we, we talk about a, a complicated many body problem, which consists of 10 to the 57 particles. So you have this basically something impossible. You have, the 10, you have 10 to the 57 particles, they all interact with each other. And so you have to solve a, a many body problem where you have 10, 10 to the 57 interacting. So you have to make sure that you use a proper many body technique to do that. Uh, the interactions and building blocks, they are initially on. Conservative picture of protons, protons, and neutrons. There will be some electrons, muons, possibly, but this will change uh, this density. So, impacts with the building blocks that depend on have to be, they have to be cocked and self consistently. Uh, if the system is dense enough, you may have first transitions of protons, neutrons. You will have probably new building blocks, new hyper, I mean, hyperons, there are delta, mm -hmm. one is a second. You may also infect. Works when if you squeeze protons and neutrons together, then they mean at some point they begin, begin to overlap in a naive picture. And so the core content, remember each proton is made up of up quarks and a down quark in a naive picture. A neutron is one up and two down quarks. So if you overlap neutrons and protons, then at some point you expect that the core content is released. Uh, and so this may actually happen in, in these stars also. So all this needs to be taken into account. And so this is more like a technical, technical illustration, but just forget about all these lines here. What we have here is it's the neutron and the proton. The neutron is made up of two, up, two down quarks, one up, proton, two up quarks, one down quark. And so these are all the building blocks of atomic nuclei. But now if you squeeze matter together in a uh, collision or in right, gravity in the neutron star, then you may have more, more massive objects, particles which are unstable in free space, but they would be high blocked in a neutron star. Once created, they would be very long. So one of one type of that called hyperons that contain one strange quarks, so it's up, down, down, one strange, up and down, one strange, up, up, one strange, so this is the sigmas and lambda and plus the plus zero and minus so the charges of each particle. There is all the cascades, the, the size particles <laughs> by minus, by not. So these are the building blocks actually, and they are easy if you do many, many body calculations. This has been shown already in, in, the, in the 70s, Pandre Pandi in his yeah, pioneering papers in the 70s, he has shown if you solve the traditional equation using um, sophisticated many body variational theory, then in fact you find all those particles. And you all not just that, you also find uh, delta particles which are more massive than 
these guys over here. But you know, if she has sufficient compression gravity, then you have so much mass energy in these stars that you produce all these particles. So these are also possible candidates and not one, which one search for that. But these are sort of particles that you would have to take into account. Of course, this is protons, then hyperons, each kind of particle, and possibly the other. So this is also the building blocks. And uh, of course, this is not an easy task. And even just as a reminder, the, the proton or the neutron, in fact, has a very complicated structure. So it's not just a simple uh, up, up, down for a proton. That's a naive picture, but uh, this is a crude approximation to actually what goes on in, in a proton. So nuclear physics is, is very hard. So in a proton, you have all these quarks, and three quarks, gluons, these spirals, there are gluons, so the forces between. Uh, these three quarks are uh, in this all the quark anti quark pairs. Uh, this is uh, the, the picture that emerged from uh, uh, an institution in her, uh, north of Germany, uh, in Hamburg. Here was here was scientific le 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 legacy. So the proton, the neutron, they all have very complicated structures, and you may not imagine what happens if you take lots and lots of 10 to the 56 and 7 protons, neutrons, if you squeeze those together, at some point the nuclear boundaries begin to overlap and they go from the Confined quark that you only can find in a, in a proton or neutron, you go to a, to a deconfined state where all these particles move as a, as a free as a quantum gas and, uh, you know, with very different properties. The heat capacity is changing of such matter, the thermal conductivity. Uh, so that's that's the big picture. The big challenge to calculate this as realistic as possible. So, good. Now let's talk more a bit about forces and uh, so just to give you an idea of what, what needs to be done. So again, this is not classical physics. So we learn about the cooler force, uh, cooler energy, cooler force with each other particle. Uh, this is not an no, no approximation to the interaction of electrons. So if you take the electron, this is called a Simon diagram. So time is uh, here, so this is this is one electron and another, and then the, the interaction of the exchange of a photon gamma here. Uh, but it's a highly quantum mechanical characteristic description, very different from from, Kudo, from the, the Kudo picture. But sort of this is the the, the, the underlying force that describes the electromagnetic or electric interactions, electric interactions. So the photons, photon exchange, and the photons they are not electrically charged, they carry no charge, they're good because then the photons can absorb with that charge. If the photons were charged and they would interact with each other, which is the case for gluons, that's why you do the distance that they're terribly complicated. So you have just one photon exchange, photons are not charged, they do not interact. If you now this would be electromagnetism now if you talk about the building blocks, neutrons, protons, baryons, they <laughs> interact with a similar picture. So I give a fine diagram, diagram, you have a proton coming in and out, so it's a scattering <laughs> here, a process and the interaction lies on photons, but these are uh, mesons, so they're called mesons, and there are a bunch of mesons, depending on how good your model will be. There's a sigma, omega, and a rho meson, and I eta. So all these are mesons and they're being exchanged between two, two baryons. This is where they have the communication. This is what we call the soft force at a certain energy scale. And this is the and next is electromagnetism, the strong force. So here we have the interacting particles are now mesons. There are three, at least three sigma omega and rho, all that needed to get it right, but it really can be more mesons. That's why I call this C plus. Uh, and uh, so the interaction here is between a boson exchange, uh, and um, it's more a trick here. We can make some sun meson field just interacting to get some nuclear physics, right? But this, this is not required. So, but the point is, what we should just take home here the photon electromagnetism, the photon exchange, a strong force has all these mesons, uh, and uh. Now, of course, you may also ask how do quarks fit in, and this is what you know, quarks do in physics. This was done by Mark Elman and, and, and Fritz Fritsch, actually. He was one of my professors in Munich, uh, and uh, 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 you know, I was a grad student, and I took classes with him. And once I gave actually a presentation about what I do, neutron stars, and uh, I, I didn't mention his name because he was actually one not the first one, but he, he, he was, he had, I was, I think the second here, he, he pointed out that in fact the neutron stars, because they are so dense, they had quarks at the core. And I saw, totally forgot about this. And so he was in the audience and yeah, he was a bit of upset about it. So <clears throat> all this gives credit to your professor. So if you add quarks here, so then 
this is called quantum probable language because the quarks are charged. So a label that you put on quark with up down range. Charm quarks are probably too massive, they will not are not likely to play a role for neutron stars. There are some issues there, could be maybe a question mark, but up down range actually are pretty easy quick to get in a neutron star. And so if you take a quark here, the quark here, then they change. Uh, so gluons, so it's kind of the counterpart to the mesons uh, with the photon, the gluons. Now, this is the nasty part. There are eight gluons, not just one photon. So we know here you have eight particles, and the gluons they carry also they carry color, so which means they keep themselves intact. So if you have one gluon here, one gluon there, then they exchange a force, and you can get blue balls, all kinds of nonlinear behavior, and that's why Mox. Uh, what, what, this is what makes the QCD really common. So you have to work basically this effective theories to away some uh, important physics and so that at the end you have something that you can work with. <clears throat> little by little. So this sounds like a horrible, uh, horribly complicated task. You have gravity, there's, uh, there's Einstein, you've got space time, and then you have this issue with the equation of state to calculate how, how much pressure did all these particles produce. That's the bad news, but the good news is, uh, and if you have never seen Lagrangians, don't worry about it. The thing is, if you have, if you would solve the system, you know, you begin at the fundamental level, which are Lagrangians, so there's one gravity and one for all the particle fields, just the good thing, you know, just like gravity and the particle fields. And now the good thing is that for neutron stars, so if you sort of solve many body problem, then the distance between two baryons, neutrons, and protons is on the order of, a, I mean, Fermi, so something short, even less than a Fermi. So, which means over the over the distance of a Fermi, uh, space time is flat. You have significant curvature from the core to the surface is in kilometers. So that's where gravity is important. That's very important. But over just the the length scale, where strongly where strongly strong interaction takes place, you can't forget about curvature. So, you do this in flat space, and so you can sort of say, okay, I dissect the Lagrange here. I do gravity, which is Einstein, so independent down here, and I do the rest, which is still complicated, but solvable in a flat, flat space. I mean, uh, uh, in the Minkowski space, so I calculate and I do my many at home, at home, do my many body problem, I calculate the equation of state as a function of energy density or pressure. Uh, and then once I'm done with this, independent from down here, then you can take this into the, the energy measurement tensor, this is your function. That depends on pressure energy. So here you have all mass. This, I mean, this, this point contains all the information about the mass in an object, and this tells you basically how much how much curvature you have. Okay. But the good the good thing is again that these two steps one and step two they are separated. So I could uh, see by a line here. If this were not the case, then this would be pretty much hopeless because then uh, the entire Dirac algebra for the experts. Uh, the gamma matrix, all the work with this, uh, how particles impact, all this could become, uh, would depend on space time, and this is basically a good deal. So that's the good thing. So we do these two, uh, uh, work on these two problems. So I have five more minutes. Uh, let me see. Uh, and calculate a model for the equation of state. So let me just show you what you would get. So these curves, they're hard to calculate, but look kind of boring, but. They are important and hard to calculate. So, what I show here is the pressure of a certain system. I mean, in this case, it's a hot actually. Uh, we call proton neutral star matter. So, this is basically remember when we started out, we have we talked about hot and, and dense matter. So, this is proton neutral star matter, protons, neutrons, all kinds of particles. We also have neutrinos still in these in this sphere that cannot escape because the midway path of neutrinos is too short. It's below, way below 10 kilometers, so they bounce back and forth. Also, constantly. Pressure. So this is sort of these are these conditions. It's the lepton fraction. This is the entropy here. So you just imagine when well, you just sort of take home here that you go down here. The initial this is the very first stage of the proton neutron star. Like the system goes down. Maybe in front of neutron stars, or a cone system. And you go down the other end like this. So if you begin with an equation of state with hot, the magnet, the neutrinos, all the particles contribute. So we have this equation sign up here, and then uh, the system cools, change its composition, it goes down, you lose pressure so from here to here, depending on the density you have. So you go down from here to the cold, uh, very online, almost cold, which is uh, the So this is again for reference, this is from the nucleus, and so you see there how much you know 
how much how much we have to increase the density we do many body calculators to find the uh, equation of state that goes all the way up to like okay, like 10 times nuclear because all this is needed to construct but this is the same thing it's just pressure and here's the, the number density so atomic nuclear here so the same structure here and important is again see uh when stars evolved and uh, the temperatures so of entropy is changing and this means initially you have a slip state problem for equation state so this provides more pressure this one is pressure drops you have less pressure so which means gravity you know if gravity is the same you may initially have something that is stable because you have a hot system more pressure but once the pressure is reduced then the system actually may collapse and form a black hole so there's a lot of interesting physics goes on that goes on in this industry uh, you can also look into uh, Last radius data, this is for for longer fading stars uh, for certain cold systems, such as temperatures less than about minutes. This is the math radius here. And what I'm showing here, this is our model for the equation of state. So there are quite a number of uncertainties that you may imagine when you model the equation, when you solve any of the equations. You have to make a front of approximation, so we don't know exactly what is what. We try to cover as much physics as possible, but of course, the uncertainties there are known unknowns and unknowns. So this is just a model, different model for the equation of state. So what you see now, these models, of course, they must agree with data that are from uh, gravitation uh, instruments. So this is gravitation rate, 17, 17th August, uh, 2017. This is from the NISA instrument, uh, which serves uh, um, a millisecond from that, you know, same gravitation wave data. You see, of course, the uncertainty of constraints that come from these experiments are still pretty large, but people are very optimistic that they will shrink down. And so, what we want basically, or of course, a model, a little bit model for the equation it's, it's, it's compatible with these, uh, uh, with these, uh, with observed data. So, the hope is that this, all these islands will become lots, a lot smaller uh, soon, and then you can really put time constraints on, on the equation of state. And it's a very exactly way. And the models are computed for different approaches. So you can maybe relax works, you can do something about boson condensates. So a lot of interesting physics can be learned from observation, it can be by observed data with theoretical models. One curve uh, I want to mention here is this blue one, which is all this speculation. But the thing is, if you have sort of a phase transition, a strong phase transition in a, in a neutron star, so some type of matter, then in fact, you may in fact produce. See all these other curves could be so you go up here with all mass stable objects, so you go up here, you have a mass peak for each equation of state, it's the most massive neutral star, it ends here. And but you see they are compatible, but you see all this excluded curve right here. And this one, this model is different from the rest because it has a very strong phase transition in about three times nuclear saturation. There's speculation this could happen, and in fact, it leads to a stars or a, a stable thermal stars up here or neutron stars. And then you have a bit of a drop down here. So this corresponds to stars which actually are unstable. They cannot exist. Because there are loose and acid three equations, but they cannot exist because they are stable in population. But it can be shown. So this would be unstable, but then you see the curve again being spins over at the minimum and then increases again. So you have sort of one stable family of stars, which is the neutral stars, and here a second branch of a family of stars. Which are called you know, twins, or sometimes it's the family of complex stars. The first family would be white dwarfs, second would be neutral stars, and the third would be uh, uh, would be the twins uh, uh, neutral stars. Some people make a lot of fuss about this. And I'm not sure how serious this should be taken, but <clears throat> this is currently being uh, explored in, in great detail. Okay, good. So let me stop here and uh, let me just show you quickly. But I have not been able to talk about. There are quite a few things. Uh, so one thing is that up down your know, atomic nuclei could be the most seem to be the most stable atomic uh, configurations. But there are speculations. Pure has theoretical that effectively may be a different type of configuration. 
I mean, up, 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 French corpse, they would be more stable than atomic nuclei, but this also has some of the implications, not just for terrestrial nuclear physics, but also for astrophysics. Uh, I talked briefly about the third, but it can also be a fourth uh, family of compact stars, depending on basically how much, what kind of base conditions you have. You may have one minimum, max, maximum, minimum, maximum, uh, one after another, each time you have a new family of stars. And uh, you also, I mean, what's interesting is you have quarks, then uh, they would form a plasma, a complicated plasma of some kind, but a quark carry charge. And so they would actually uh, can lead to what's called a cooler lattice. So the idea is that you have basically blobs of quarks. You know, you have, first of all, you have a quark gas. And then the system becomes more dense, and the quarks, therefore, blobs, bigger and bigger systems. And these, these systems, they form a lattice. So you have basically quark blobs arranged on a lattice and uh, immersed in the electron gas. So this would mean, this, I mean, has an implication for what's called Bremsstrahlung, neutrino emission. So I had a PhD student, William Spinella, he worked on this uh, in uh, this program for a number of years and he did a wonderful work on that. Uh, and uh, basically just one, two things here, the richest Spilani is here. I wanted to mention that Spilani works on the evolution of photon neutron stars. And what I've talked about here is differential rotations of the, all these stars rotate as rigid bodies. But since stars are hard, the viscosity is changing. Uh, and uh, uh, so what would happen, what's likely is that these stars, different parts of the stars spin at different frequencies. Sounds like an easy task, but in GR, it's terribly complicated. So the lady works on this very detail. And I have also one student, Sir Cohn, he's falling asleep, I guess he's sleeping. But he works on modified series of gravity. So Einstein's theory, that we have shown it, Einstein tensor, it's probably the correct C, uh, the correct tensor of strong of, 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 of relativity, but we can actually add extra terms which are compatible with Einstein's field equation or in Einstein's theory uh, and uh, energy momentum conservation. But uh, there, there's, at this point, there's no need if you look at gravitation waves, black hole physics, there seems to be no need for that. But with respect to dark energy, and uh, so people argue that on a large scale, in fact, Einstein's theory would be his field tensor would be modified or. If, if you do that, then you can explain some uh, dark matter, I mean, dark energy physics. Okay. So thank you so much for your attention. All right, thank you very much for the talk. Um, after all that information, uh, we shouldn't let him go without uh, making him answer some questions. Uh, anyone uh, want to start? Yeah, uh, so when you discussed the star rotation, I think it was that plot where you basically came from like football, not yeah. just here. Is there a consistent phase of particle creation in the core? Yeah. So would you see it basically repeated every single time? I know. See, the thing is, you would have a continuous, I mean, if you take a neutron star isolated, the star emits gravitation waves, uh, electron positive wind, so it loses the energy, it spins down, and then it during spin down, it's the system gets more and more compressed and then produces the particles at a certain so the, the spin frequency is connected to the, the given density at the center. And so if the spin frequency drops down, gravity just squeezes all the stuff more and more tightly together. And at some point you produce, you have reached a threshold for a new particle. Uh, and so there's, there's a connection between when this happens to the, the spin frequency. And once the particle mm -hmm. has been produced, then it sits there and uh, in the, it's, it's uh, Number of particles will increase depending on the uh, keep squeezing. And uh, but then you can after I mean, then if, if there are more phase transitions or no, if you allow for new particles, more open channels to be filled, then to spin down you have more and more new particles. And this could even even could even produce quarks. Uh, and uh if you ask, there was actually one paper that it was it's an, a very old story, but uh, this is not this one. Even when, when this happens, so if you take a model like this, the composition of it, it would look like quite a star. This is a density. So you see a low density nucleus over here. You have protons and neutrons, you see, and some electrons. Uh, and then if you increase the density, so once the thresholds are reached, you produce new particles. At that point, if you may hear four times, five times, you can point five times according to this model. You also, your system is so dense, in fact, that you may actually produce up down the threshold. And the, the, the thing is, again, this is, Speculation. So if, if this, if the transition, I mean, 
I mean, this happens, then you may actually have a change in the, in the equation of space. So this is going to be the blue part here, which is the low density machine here, the neutrons, neutrons, leptons, hyperons, so along this path and along the initial composition space. Then the equation of state. But once you produce quarks, in fact, then you have a change in the slope. And so if you have a mixed space between <coughs> an all hydronic space and quarks, and once all the hydronic stuff is done and you have only, only quarks, then you follow this path. And if you feed this into Einstein's field equation, then in fact, this can lead to when I, this will change the moment of inertia. And so basically, what happens is this ice skater phenomenon. So initially, the star spins down rapidly and then produces a quark layer or and then once it happens, the star squeezes and squeezes together. So the moment of inertia is changing. And you know, from my, I'm not sure about ice skating, it's not so, maybe not so popular in San Diego, but from an ice skater from the Olympics, an ice skater upon contracting the arm, the person that he or she spins up. And we actually had a, a paper many years ago that you have, you may have to see this phenomenon in a neutral star, an isolated neutral star that actually it spins up for no reason, uh, but a significant rate because of uh, driven by a phase transition. But you know, observers need to do me a favor and find one. Maybe Paige was next. Yeah. Um, so one, I thought that was a really good talk. Thank I you. felt like I could follow the entire thing personally with. And two, when it comes to the neutron star absorbing its companion, like what happens out of it? Uh, inside the neutron star, what do you? So, you know, what you have is basically it's matter which is being dumped onto the neutron star. So the mass goes up, the system becomes more dense. And, uh, and also, the, the, it's a tricky question because, first of all, if you accrete matter, this, you have mass dumping onto the star. So the mass star becomes more mass. At the same time, the star is being spun up, which means if you increase the frequency, this lowers the density of the system. So you have a, a, a delicate balance between uh, gravity and the spin up, which sort of pushes matter outside and lowers the density. And to calculate this, um, I had a, many years ago, I had a student who worked on this for a little while, but we didn't really get very far. It's a complicated pro uh, problem, so we could do this basically with, with Newtonian physics in some CR, but we, uh, I'm not sure, it could be either way. Maybe if the compression wins, uh, and if this happens, if the star is, if, if the net effect is a compression of the star, then you would have a, a new particle population. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, you know, you reach all the extra thresholds. The, the, you have these degrees of freedom, and then they stay inside this object. If the spin up is just too rapidly, and then the, the density at the center just drops, then you would lose degrees of freedom. And so, you would basically, you could maybe you could go from a composition where you have, uh, you know, all these particles, maybe even quarks. So you spin up, the density drops, the threshold is, but basically these particles are just disappeared, they just spun out of the star. So you end up with initially something that has all kinds of particles, protons, neutrons, hyperons, deltas, quarks, and then you end up finally with something that has just neutrons and protons. So there's a lot of interesting physics, but this would change the heat capacity. I have mentioned that some of these particles, in fact, they form color, I mean, quarks form a color superconductor, neutrons, proton, neutrons would form a superfluid, Protons, since they are charged to form a, possibly a, a, super, uh, a superconductor. And so this would mean the heat capacity is changing uh, the, the, uh, the neutrino, I mean, I mean, the mean free path would change. So you have transfer properties which change, and so the star, which is thermal reaction response, would be different. So this can, should, could be theoretically be observed, but it will be hard to, uh, because of mass accretion, the system is, of course, highly non equilibrium. So to see what is what is hard. That's a good point. Here's a question. Uh, yes, yeah, so when you're calculating the equations of C, um, do you generally stick with that issue of kind of um, like models, or do you, is there any room for uh, more phenomenological approaches to nuclear structure and that kind of thing? Uh, you can do both. Uh, and so, what we do is, I mean, you can just solve the Schrodinger equation and put up in some money, many body problems. So, you use Schrodinger, the Hamiltonian, you have kinetic and potential. And the forces would be it's a two body force, but uh, no. Since at least for these systems, it's also you have most likely have got three body forces. And there are very good models. Well, from Urbana, Illinois, the group has uh, excellent models, Argon, I guess. So that they are being used by some people. And I mean, to be frank, there are, there's one camp, like, you know, I belong to this more exotic camp, but there's, you know, a second camp, they're more conservative and they like 
neutrons and protons, not nothing much, not, not much else. And so uh, they are sort of, there's, there's a bunch of indications just for them just to use uh, uh, a strategy approach and to solve them. It's, it's of course still very complicated to solve the Schrodinger uh, many body problem you know, and it's a particle state, a variation study, a variation calculation, you minimize an energy functional. Uh, and, uh, and it's, but either way, you can calculate, you calculate the equation of state. The Schrodinger picture, of course, is a relativistic picture has, is, is different in the far as that you have, uh, when you have the direct picture, you have sort of, yes, that's the vacuum, and a real vacuum, not you have to take out the area. <laughs> so it's a quantum mechanical vacuum. And if a particle propagates in a medium or in free space, it couples through the, the, the vacuum. So there's, which gives the particle a, a, effective mass, the electrons have an effective charge and all this. And to calculate all these properly, you really do begin with a realistic quantum picture. Uh, you can cover some of these aspects also, but the Schrodinger description, there's nothing wrong. Uh, but uh, the quantum field theoretical description is a bit more complicated, more, more complete, I would say. The drawback is that, because you have to work with, uh, uh, with all these particles, the threshold. So you have to use what's called propagators. How uh, a particle moves from one spot to another, so it plows through a medium, just you know, it should plow through, it should <laughs> run through water or something or swim. There's, there's the medium which <laughs> holds you back. And so you interact with the medium. And so you have these, all these particles in a neutral star's core, so it tends to be something 57, and then you can take a given proton, neutron, hyperon, whatever, and just plow through the medium. And so you have to figure out how this interaction takes place is called the mass operator. That is a fancy word basically for a single particle potential. Uh, but it, to calculate this in a field theoretical description, uh, this all comes out, uh, can be done very nicely. And it's in a more complete picture, but uh, you know, <clears throat> there, may, there may be people out there that say, no, this is nonsense. Use the Schrodinger equation, many body problems. This will be uh, as good as uh, you don't need quantity. Then now 